if Dr. Higgins will come up on the stage now, I will tell you a little bit about him. We are very fortunate indeed to have a well-informed individual here from Canada to tell us something about socialized medicine. And uh, Dr. Higgins' wife is also a medical graduate who had studied with Dr. Jordan and other people here in Boston. So it is not as a stranger that he comes here, but he comes to talk to us about a very important issue which has affected his life personally in Canada and which may affect the lives of a great many of us here in America. And I'm very happy indeed to be able to present Dr. Gordon Higgins from Calgary, Alberta. Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a privilege and honor to be here this evening. We have many fond memories of Boston. My second son was born in Boston. We are reminded of this each day uh, when our Canadians or Maple Leafs are playing Boston because there is always one lone dissenter cheering for Boston. But I suppose that is the sort of loyalty that Bostonians expect of their native sons. <laughs> we have always heard that when Americans do something, they do it up well. And certainly this rally, starting at 10 o'clock, with no time out for lunch or supper or anything else, is uh, making me believe that you are living up to your traditions. And this has certainly made me understand uh, why they execute people at daybreak instead of uh, five after nine at night waiting to give this talk to you. <coughs> now, I think that the social and political ideals to which a person adheres must be understood before one can properly understand and evaluate that person's statement on political and economic problems. For this reason, the speaker sets out his own basic beliefs and defines terms which will be used in the discussion of compulsory medical care insurance which fall. And these ideas and these statements are entirely my own. I do not speak for organized medicine for the Canadian Medical Association or anybody else, for, nor for any group of American doctors. Solely my own, and these are my own conceptions of the terms that will be used. Now it is assumed that Western democracy is a combination of the liberal idea of personal rights protecting the individual and the democratic idea proper proclaiming equality of rights and popular sovereignty. It is assumed that Western democracy recognizes the dualism of man's nature, that man is a part of the state, but also possessed of inalienable personal rights anterior and superior to and independent of the state. Now, on the rights of the individual, I would like to quote from Professor Friedman's legal theory. The evolution of the individual as the ultimate measure of things and the consideration of government and authority, not as a divine right or an end in itself, but as a means to achieve the development of the individual, can be described as the basic political and legal idea of modern Western society and as a universally accepted standard of democratic society. The development of the individual to his full potentialities is an old idea, inherent to Athenian democracy and fully developed in Stoic philosophy. It is given a new and deeper foundation through the Christian conception, and I would say through the Judeo-Christian conception, of a direct spiritual relation between God and the individual. But the conception of a society based on definite rights of the individual citizen is a relatively modern one, developed in reaction first against the medieval order of society and secondly against the absolutist government of the modern state in the 17th and 18th centuries. It finds expression in the legal philosophy of Locke, the French Declaration of the Rights of Man, and the American Constitution. This trend of thought postulates specific and viable individual rights the integrity of life, personal liberty, and property. Right, not duty, is stressed. And also the individual as a self-contained unit resisting the intrusion of government. 
Now, it is further believed that the most essential rights are those which protect the essential personal faculties and spiritual values, such as freedom of worship and intellectual freedom. Other less personal rights and freedoms are freedom of contract, freedom of labor, and freedom of, freedom of association, etc. The right of a person or individual to sell his labor and services upon such terms as he deems proper is the very essence of individual freedom, and conversely, a denial of this right is the very essence of, individ of involuntary servitude. And so there we are. We have democracy with its fine balance between popular will and individual right. And the problem has always been the reconciliation of popular will with individual right. Because if either one of these is taken to extreme, if popular will is the supreme right, there can be no individual right. And if individual right is the supreme right, there can be no popular will. And the fine balance between these two is the essential feature of democracy. <clears throat> and the idea that an individual can stand up to the state, one individual against the state, is a very noble idea. This has had expression only for a few years, about 500 BC, in the time of uh, the Stoics in Athens and Sparta, there were never legal guarantees of freedom in existence from 500 BC until approximately 2,500 years later in 1787 when your constitution was written down. These were the first guarantees of freedom of the individual against the all-powerful state. And this, without doubt, is the most legal, most noble legal document ever produced by man. And this fragile and precious idea of personal liberty against the state is what is under attack in our country. In Saskatchewan, the issue was this. Could an individual resist the all-powerful will of the state? And this was what the battle in Saskatchewan was ultimately fought on. The rights of the individual to resist the intrusion of the state and to resist involuntary servitude. Now, if in a democracy there is any diminution in respect for the tradition of personal liberty, and if personal liberty is not guaranteed by law, individuals and minority groups are vulnerable to involuntary servitude to the state and to exploitation by the state. You must understand, in Canada there are no constitutional guarantees of personal liberty, only tradition and custom. There are no legal guarantees of freedom in Canada, only tradition and custom. If there is diminution in respect for this tradition, the most vulnerable individuals and minority groups to exploitation will be those possessing special skills which are in great demand and whose ethical code, based on correlative rights and duties, is considered by the impositor to preclude effective resistance to servitude and exploitation. The vulnerability to involuntary servitude and exploitation increases as state monopoly increases. The dangers of concentration of power in the state for individuals and minorities increase as the state becomes the sole purchaser of the services of these individuals and minority groups. While state industries and institutions employ individuals and groups with special skills, all their workers have volunteered their services and they are free to change to other industries and institutions in the private sector. If a democratic state legislates an individual or minority group into involuntary servitude and thereby breaks the natural law that man shall be free. The laws of natural justice demand resistance by the injured party. However, 
the moral and ethical laws of the minority groups prohibit totally effective, effective resistance. The minority group is thus placed in a dilemma. One, if it resists, as natural justice demands, it transgresses its own ethical and moral laws. If it submits, it surrenders a natural right of man, freedom from involuntary servitude. Effective resistance can be achieved only at the expense of morals and ethics, and conversely, morals and ethics may be maintained by a surrender of personal liberty. As the, idea of le as the idea of freedom is lost, and the idea of legislated servitude gains, more citizens will be faced with a similar dilemma. At present, when the liberty of individuals and minority groups is threatened, legal guarantees of freedom and liberty must be established in our country and reaffirmed in your country while there is still time. It is for these reasons that vulnerable individuals and groups must now advocate and insist that legal guarantees of freedom and liberty be established or reaffirmed for one and all under the rule of law. It must be remembered the welfare of citizen, physician, and state over any extended period is identical. The state if it coerces or forces physicians into servitude, may appear for the moment to gain an advantage for its citizens at the expense of the physicians. But as the expropriated medical capital is exhausted, and as a career in medicine, already decreasing in attraction, becomes less attractive to ambitious youth. Just let me digress for a moment. Medicine is becoming less attractive now. In the United States of America, the application rate, and this information is from the datagrams of the Associated Association of American Medical Schools. In 1950, there were 24,434 applications. These, this, these are the boys on the farm and the girls that want to go in, not the medical schools keeping them out. This dropped in 1958 to 15,971, and last year, 1961, 14,397. The application rate has dropped then from 24,000 to 14,000 in 10 years. Your population has increased from 151 million to 179 million. And so when I say, and as a career, already decreasing in attraction, becomes less attractive to ambitious youth, then the state and the citizen will discover that what seems so right in theory is so wrong in practice. The advocates of the theory of medical care as a right disregard the fact, well known to physicians, that clever and ambitious youth will not be tempted into medicine as a career if the doctors are obliged to sign a best, basically unethical contract with the state a contract which demands a legal surrender of the personal rights of the physician to the state and allows the patient to become an article of commerce in the contract between physician and the state and reduce the physician to the status of an agent of the state. This was the status of the British hospital doctor by Lord Justice Denning's decision. And so when we say an article of commerce and an agent of the state, this is the legal adjustment judgment of Lord Justice Denning in the High Court of, of England. Such a contract is foreign to the ancient tenets of medical ethics. These ideas explain the immigration of doctors from Great Britain and Saskatchewan. While the citizens of Great Britain are still apparently pleased with free medical care, it is equally apparent many of the British physicians are not at all satisfied. Great Britain is losing by immigration a number of doctors equivalent to one-third of its medical graduates. As Davidson says, a distinguished British doctor, not only has the National Health Service provided outrageous terms and conditions of service, it has completely failed to inspire respect among the younger members of the profession who see through its Fabian humbug. This talk is a plea for a recognition of the fact that 
in considering implantation of a plan of compulsory medical care insurance, it is not sufficient to merely ascertain the wishes of the majority of recipients of medical care. If Western democracy achieves medical care insurance through compulsion and by legislating into involuntary servitude those whose lot it would become to provide the medical care, then Western democracy becomes a pious fiction. Since the basic problem in the development and continuation of the ideals and tenets of Western democracy is the protection of the rights of individuals and minorities, the crystallization and protection of the rights of individuals and minorities by basic constitutional enactment is an absolute necessity in Canada. Now, the great issue of our time is the struggle between communism and democracy, between a political system that reposes all authority and power in the state with the denial of individual freedom and liberty, and a philosophy founded upon the freedom, liberty, and dignity of the individual. And into the question of international communism, I am not proceeding. I think we have had that pretty well fully covered today. But the great national issue of our time, I believe, in our country at least, is the struggle between the claims of the welfare state and the claims of private enterprise. Americans and Canadians can hope and work for a satisfactory resolution of this issue, one that will provide the greatest social justice compatible with the greatest pres preservation of individual freedom and responsibility. The democratic idea is stated in Lincoln's government of the people, by the people, for the people. This presumes that the majority will act in the best interest of the nation. The majority may, however, desire to oppress a minority, and precautions are needed as much against this form of oppression as against any other abuse of power. It is opportune to recall that numerous philosophers and patriots have repeatedly warned, warned against and mistrusted unchecked majority rule. We have been repeatedly warned the tyranny of the majority is among the evils mankind must constantly be on guard against. Popular sovereignty is a safeguard against certain forms of tyranny. It can also be as tyrannical as any other form of despotism. It may ignore all restraints, claiming an unlimited power and justifying that power on the grounds it represents the general will. A quote from your great constitutionalist Madison is opportune. There is nothing to check the inducements to sacrifice the weaker party or an obnoxious individual. Montesquieu, whose writings had such influence upon the American constitutionalists, believed freedom could only be maintained by a separation of the executive, legislative, and judicial powers of government. In his spirit of the laws, he states, every man invested with power is apt to abuse it and to carry his authority as far as it will go. To prevent this abuse, it is necessary from the very nature of things that power should be a check to power. Hobbes, in his criticism of democracy, states that orators with their power to accuse can destroy popular assembly that democratic groups have no protection against majorities, no liberty to dissent from the course of the major part, be it good or bad. He wrote that before 1787. The same author is concerned over the susceptibility of, de of democracy to the mischief of demagogues. He says of popular assemblies that they are as subject to evil counsel and to be seduced by orators as a monarch by flatters. And as a result, democracy tends to degenerate into government by the most popular orator. Alexander Hamilton said, you must first enable the government to control the government and in the next place oblige it to control itself. Now in the Western democracies, the doctrine of the general will which places such power in the hands of the majority, emerged only after the people's basic individual liberties were firmly entrenched 
and powerful non-governmental organizations and institutions existed to defend these liberties. The dangers feared by Hobbes and others did not arise quickly in the classical democracies of the West because the opportunities of the rule to resist oppression were kept in balance and there has been a mutual understanding between ruler and rule that certain actions, although not prohibited by law, were contrary to ancient custom and tradition. In the nations of the West, lacking this tradition of personal liberty, democracy has not fared well. The subordination of the individual to the collective majority has resulted in communism. Demagogues inciting the masses gave rise to Nazism and fascism. Their common evil, a denial of personal freedom and liberty, a denial of the right to set a value upon oneself or one's labor, a compulsion to submit to the absolute will of the collective majority or the individual will of the dictator. And this again, in Saskatchewan was the issue that the doctors must submit to the will of the collective majority and the danger, the dreadful danger that I see in our nation is, is the fact that when you ask people what democracy is, and this applies to lawyers and, and doctors and arts graduates, most will say and stop that it is popular will, popular majority. This, of course, if this is where you stop, any form of internal tyranny is justified on the basis that it represents the general will. And this was the, the, the philosophy that many of the people in Saskatchewan had. Now, one of the great current problems in the emerging democracies of Africa and Asia is the absence of individuals, organizations, and institutions which are independent and represent a source of power outside the government. There is also an absence of a tradition of personal political liberty and freedom. The intelligentsia and opinion formers, such as newspapers, who serve in many countries to criticize the government, are in the service of the state. There is an almost total lack of independent thinking on matters of personal liberty. This is opposed to thinking personal liberty as opposed to national liberty. There is a good deal of thinking on in that, but there would seem to be little evidence of thinking along lines of personal liberty. And at the time of your revolution, of course, it was not just the external tyranny that the patriots were concerned about. It was they were concerned that these basic individual and alienable rights should be spelled out, which the British system, of course, still does not spell out. It must be remembered, individual liberties were not created by the relatively simple mechanism of granting the franchise to vote. The vote does little to strengthen the rule against the ruler. Majority rule can become, in theory, the most tyrannical form of government conceivable. Its absolutism is tempered only by its impermanence. John Stuart Mill states, the rights and interests of every or any person are only secure from being disregarded when the person entrusted is himself able and habitually disposed to stand up for them. Each is the only safe guardian of his own rights and interests. Human beings are only secure from evil at the hands of others in proportion as they have the power of being and are self-protected. And conversely, as Pope John XXIII states in Matter and Magister, paragraph 57, experience in fact shows that where the personal initiative of individuals is lacking, political tyranny appears. It must be remembered then, individual liberties and freedom were created by various groups so organizing themselves that they were in a position to fight for their rights. The franchise was the reward of such determination and conviction. Personal liberty is endangered 
Then, in the new democracies of Africa and Asia, as there is no balance of power between rulers and rule, no opportunity for powerful groups and institutions to evolve outside the government, there is a more subtle danger to freedom and liberty in the classical democracy. Freedom is endangered in the old democracies of the West as government power spreads over institutions and groups that have traditionally acted as checks to the power of the state. Even more dangerous is a diminution and emerging disregard and disrespect for certain traditionally inalienable freedoms and rights, such as freedom from involuntary servitude. The ancient criticisms of popular government, a fear of the tyranny of the majority, as expressed in the early writings of the Greek philosophers, become more meaningful. The more recent writings of Locke, Paine, Montesquieu in the 17th century which so influenced the American constitutionalists also becomes more meaningful. The American Constitution contains the strongest guarantee of inalienable individual rights, and these rights are protected against executive and legislative enroachment. The separation of powers and the immense power assigned to the Supreme Court and the Constitution of the United States were attempts to protect the rights of the minority and the basic freedom and liberty of the individual citizen against the majority. Citizens and patriots who had defeated tyranny from abroad were equally prepared to defend tyranny, to defeat tyranny from within. In North America today, legislation is used more and more to restrict individual freedom. The state is changing from the role of protector to that of controller resulting in an ever-increasing bureaucracy. When the state offers the citizens a free, tax-supported service, it must assume the duty of regulating the fee for the service, as it cannot combine the responsibility of a free tax-supported service without ultimate authority. The state alone can levy and dispense public monies. Thus, an act or bill, although it supposedly only appropriates money for a free service, can effectively control a profession, group, or institution. The state must set the terms, conditions, and standards governing its expenditure and decide who is qualified to receive payment and under what conditions. There is no more effective way to exercise control than by a control of income. He who pays the piper calls the tune. Alexander Hamilton in number 79 of the Federalist states this idea another way. In the general course of human nature, a power over a man's subsistence amounts to a power over his will. Economic control is present whenever any agency, government or private, becomes the sole buyer and seller of medical services or any other services in the community. Bureaucratic government control must exist over any free tax-supported service and the dangers to freedom proportionately increase. For example, if the legal profession were socialized, and this has been advocated by some politicians in Canada, who would represent the individual against the state? Or if citizens enamored of a slogan, cleanliness next to godliness, advocated free tax-supporting plumbing as a right, would the guilds and unions agree to the principle of economic control by the state, to the principle of compulsory arbitration, to the principle of the state having power to legislate its own idea of a fair wage? Are not some citizens in favor of free tax-supported services with government control and compulsory arbitration, with the state having power to legislate its own point of view, but only when it applies to somebody else and not themselves? I believe that the greatest overall productivity has been achieved in nations where a free economy prevails, where individuals rely on what they themselves can do rather than on what others can do for them. And I know of no evidence to refute this belief. Why then is there a trend for the state to restrict more and more the scope of private enterprise, individual freedom and liberty? One credible answer is that modern democracy has restricted individual right due to a sense of social duty 
by restricting the income of the more prosperous and productive, the less prosperous are given that much more right to social justice. Social justice has largely been achieved by restriction of income through progressive taxation and by collective bargain. Social justice has never been attempted by coercing a group into involuntary servitude as was attempted in the province of Saskatchewan. The state endangers freedom when it enforces servitude of minorities and individuals which deserve to be free, which should not be exploited by the state. There is grave danger that modern states are hiding political expediency under the name of social justice. Now I want to go in to the question of rights and duties because this is basic to the question of Medicare. The advocates of the welfare state and socialized medicine in particular have adopted the slogan medical care is a right and would demand medical care is a right. It is opportune to analyze and study the implications and possible consequences of this demand and this will be initiated by quoting excerpts from Sir John Salmon's classic work on jurisprudence. And these concepts on rights and duties summarize the Western democratic legal philosophy of individual right balanced by individual duty. That is, in the common law, which we have in Canada and you have in America, we believe in individual right balanced by individual duty. And this is the basis of the common law in our two countries. Conversely, in communism and fascism, individual right and duty is denied. The only right in communism is the right of the collective majority. We come back to our balances again. There is no personal right in the face of the right of the collective majority. And if we go extremes the other way in fascism the only right is the right of the state with the denial of individual right so here are the three concepts of right the democratic concept of individual right and individual duty the collectivism of the communists the the statism of the fascists and Nazis. now to quote from Sam rights are either moral or legal this then is the Western democratic philosophy of right and duty. A moral or natural right is an interest recognized and protected by a rule of natural justice, an interest the violation of which would be a moral wrong and respect for which is a moral duty. If there are no rights save those which the state creates, it logically follows that nothing is right and nothing is wrong save that which the state establishes and declares as such. Rights and duties are necessarily correlative. There can be no right without a corresponding duty, or duty without a corresponding right, any more than there can be a husband without a wife, or a father without a child. Legal rights then create freedom and at the same time deny freedom. Now medical care as a right. It is generally accepted that the citizen has a moral right to medical care and the physician a moral duty to provide. This is a relationship which dates, outdates any state in existence, goes back thousands of years. In a democratic society, the legal claim to this right is valid only under certain circumstances. Medical care as a legal right should not infringe upon or require the sacrifice of other legal or moral rights, such as those contained in the Constitution of the United States of America or the tradition of personal liberty in Canada. If the state assumes the duty of providing medical care, this duty can be discharged only through the medical profession. The state cannot provide the, the care. Medical care can become a legal right if physicians accept or are legislate, legislated into servitude. To establish medical care as a legal right will be necessary either a for the physicians to abrogate their personal liberty 
or for the state to impose upon the physicians involuntary servitude. And a quotation from Rousseau nicely sums up the situation. To renounce liberty is to renounce being a man, to surrender the rights of humanity, to remove all liberty from man's will, is to remove all morality from man's acts. It is an empty and contradictory convention that sets up, on the one hand, absolute authority, and on the other, unlimited obedience. Is it not clear that we can be under no obligation to a person from whom we have the right to extract everything? Now, to summarize the conditions under compulsory, under a free compulsory state medical care program, the citizen has an unlimited right to the physician's services. He has no corresponding duty or obligation to the physician. He can be under no obligation to the physician from whom he has the right to extract everything. The citizen, the physician, in the common law relationship, individual right, individual duty, under compulsory, free, tax-supported medical care, the citizen has a call on the doctor. The doctor has no call on the citizen. The state tells the physician what he will work for. The state tells the citizen what he will pay taxes for. And so you have, instead of the British common and American common law relationship, you have an administrative relationship. The state has an unlimited right to the physician's services. Its only duty is to pay or promise to pay a fee to the physician and to determine the amount of the fee. The state can be under no obligation to one from whom it has the right to extract everything. The physician's only right is the right to do his duty to the state. Now, this concept of right and duty is the very essence of the philosophy of communism and fascism. This is not to say for one minute that the people that are advocating Medicare in Canada are fascists or communists. They are not. But they are using this philosophy of right and duty, which is the, the cornerstone of this totalitar totalitarian philosophy a concept of right and duty totally foreign to the Western democratic concept of individual right and individual duty. And this concept is the, base, the basis of the laws of the isms which proclaim society and the state as the end, the individual only the means, a cogwheel in the machine. When viewed in the light of the foregoing comments, the essential issue over compulsory universal health insurance, controlled and operated by the state, becomes a special case of the general problem of the rights of a minority group in a democracy. Individual rights can exist or be suppressed in a democracy just as they can exist under a benevolent despot or be suppressed by a cruel one. Now, when the Saskatchewan government brought in this compulsion, which gave them the right to have a physician, as their attorney general said, treat polar bears at the North Pole. And this was the sort of power they had, and there was no attempt to deny it. On the plains of Saskatchewan, an incredible thing happened. This government had been in power and undefeated since 1944, had won every election, there was an uprising of the people. The doctors compromised momentarily to some degree their ethics to preserve their personal liberty, feeling this would be eventually in the best interests of the people. The Keep Our Doctors Committee, composed of small businessmen and farmers, organized, marched on the Capitol, and it, it was reaching the stage almost of, 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 uh, of uh, revolt in that province, and every newspaper, every single daily and every single weekly newspaper in the province of Saskatchewan 
supported the stands of the stand of the medical profession. There was not one exception. And this is what I would like to ask you. We, the doctors in Saskatchewan, oppose this on the basis of the tradition of personal liberty, where it is not written out or spelled out. The big papers from your country came up there, and to my knowledge, almost all of them were against the doctors. The people in the little towns and villages of 500 and 1,000 owned the newspaper. Now, why was it then that the people who the, the so-called strike was against were supporting the doctors? and the papers from outside, without any real knowledge of the issues, were against them. I suggest the reason is that because just as so many of us are losing the concept of personal rights and the integrity of inalienable personal rights in a democratic society, these people were actually saying that the tradition of your 13th Amendment has no place in Canada because the issue was clearly whether there would be involuntary servitude or not. And this is something that I think we should all think a good deal about. The concept of involuntary servitude, this was the issue. And this is the way the great majority of the American press reacted to this issue. But in the towns and villages where the people were involved and knew this story, they were 100%. 95 weeklies and the five big dailies supported the stand of freedom in Saskatchewan. <laughs> Democracy has two excesses to avoid. Extreme inequality, which results in exploitation and servitude and extreme equality, which results in tyranny and servitude. The great problem of democratic political and legal thought has been the reconciliation of popular will with the individual rights, and in particular, of the rights of the majority with the rights of the minority. The basic argument against compulsory state medicine is that it abrogates the rights of those receiving the care and more especially those providing the care. All else is a consequence of the violation of these basic rights and freedoms. It is indeed in Congress that citizens who have striven centuries for the right to bargain for their services would now propose to abrogate the, the right of a minority group to bargain for theirs. The fact this is happening in Canada suggests that Canadians should demand written constitutional guarantees of traditional rights, such as freedom from civil conscription and involuntary servitude, applicable to all citizens. May I respectfully suggest that citizens in the United States of America should make clear that in their criticism and resistance to increasing state power, they are merely acting in the forefront for the moment of the battle carried on for centuries by all Americans to ensure the continuance of these inalienable rights granted to American citizens in the Declaration of Independence and in the Fifth and Thirteenth Amendments to the Constitution. The important thing for citizens to bear in mind and to make others realize is that in criticizing and resisting within the framework of your Constitution increasing state power, you are acting with an identity of purpose to all who in your country uphold to the full the famous words from your Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that amongst these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Your concern and that of every citizen in this country is to ensure in the words of Article 13 of your Constitution, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. To base your cause on your inalienable rights will, will emphasize the fundamental and basic nature of the threat to liberty 
and bring it into a proper perspective. In Saskatchewan, the fundamental moral and legal issue in the controversy over universal compulsory health service controlled and operated by the state was not the issue of goodness or badness of ends. The fundamental issue was the rightness or wrongness of means. In a democracy, is civil conscription, or in the words of your constitution, involuntary servitude, the price to be paid by those who acquire special skills and knowledge. Is compulsory arbitration, with the state empowered to legislate its own point of view, the democratic way? In a democracy, should the state be allowed to coerce a minority group and reduce it to servitude? Are Lincoln's famous words, government of the people, by the people, for the people, to become government of the people, by the majority, for the majority? If the basic ideas and freedoms and rights formally declared in your Constitution are not upheld, there is danger of evil times ahead, evil times if promises are made that cannot with justice be fulfilled. There is danger citizens may not understand the thwarting of their will, nor realize its fulfillment must infringe upon the rights and freedom of others. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Higgins. We are indeed grateful for your long journey and the very expressive way in which you have told us about the basic problem.